All right, hey there everyone. Steve Kornacki here at the Big Board. High noon on a Tuesday and not just any Tuesday. This Tuesday means we are officially 14 days or two weeks away from the midterms. We've been here every week counting this thing down and now we are so close to the election we're going to be here every day counting this thing down until the big day election day two weeks from today. We call this show 218. We are bringing you the latest that we have when it comes to polls, when it comes to numbers, when it comes to trends, trying to figure out how this race is taking shape as we enter what is now clearly the home stretch, the final few days. Hey, voting is already underway in a lot of states all around the country right now. Ballots are already being cast all over the place. So we're going to take you through, through some of the numbers we're seeing, and then we're going to break it down. Every day we've got a special guest here, sometimes a Democrat, sometimes a Republican, sometimes somebody in the middle. All people who are looking at the same data, the same numbers we're looking at, try to get a sense of what they are seeing, how they are looking at it. So we will begin today's show. We thought today we would look, hey, we call this 218, the race to the House, 218. That's the majority for either party. You get to 218, you have a majority in the House. We've been talking a lot in the last couple days about this idea that, hey, the Democrats have been favored all year to take back the House, but that maybe there's this rise in energy on the Republican side. So the question of how real that is and what that could do in terms of complicating potentially the Democrats' path to a majority, to getting to 218. So we thought we would take you through this in a couple steps, the way we're looking at it a little bit right now. So let's start right here. Now, remember, overall, to get to that 218 number, what the Democrats need, sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. What the Democrat, let's try that again. What the Democrats need here is to get 23 seats. They need a net gain of 23 seats. I don't know why that didn't circle. I thought it was going to circle, but a net gain of 23 seats. Now, what they have here is sort of we're showing you 25 seats that have one thing in common. They're all held by Republicans right now in every one of the districts you see right here also voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. So Republican seats that went for Hillary Clinton, they didn't like Trump too much in 2016. Consider that sort of the first line of attack for Democrats. And a lot of these districts, not all of them, but a lot of these districts, when we talk about that suburban energy Democrats have had, those sort of white college educated voters, women in particular, more upscale professionally, white collar professional, that sort of thing. A lot of these districts fit that, uh, fit that sort of profile. You can look in New Jersey. You got one there. Pennsylvania, Virginia's 10th district just outside of Washington, D.C. This is Kansas's third district right outside of uh, Kansas City, Denver's, uh, Colorado's sixth district right outside of Denver. Well, we've got some new polling in the last week in these districts. A lot of districts that fit this kind of mold uh, that Democrats have been eyeing in the polling Pretty consistent in terms of what we're seeing. New Jersey 7th District, six-point lead here for the Democratic challenger. Pennsylvania's 1st District, just outside Philly, seven-point lead for the Democratic challenger. Virginia's 10th, outside D.C., seven-point lead for the Democratic challenger. Colorado 6th, nine-point lead for the Democratic challenger. And Kansas is 3rd, nine-point lead for the Democratic challenger. So, again, when you start to look at that map, Democrats need a net gain of 23. You just start going through the suburban seats right here. They could make a pretty big dent in that 23 just right there with the kind of trend we're showing you. Additionally, some of these districts too, California's 10th district, for instance, a couple others have large Hispanic populations. We saw in our NBC poll this week, maybe there's an increase in the Hispanic interest level heading into this election. Would that help Democrats in those seats? So for Republicans, they're just playing defense in so many of these districts. What they need to hope here in this sort of first line attack for Democrats is just to contain the damage. There are a few places we can see the 48th district of California. We'll zoom in Orange County. Dana Rohrbacher defending that seat. This poll just came out today. Thought this was interesting from our friends at Monmouth. They got Rohrbacher ahead by two points. They say something very interesting has happened in this district because they polled it before and Rohrbacher was losing. Now they got him winning by two. They say the big difference here, one of the big differences is that Rohrbacher's support has increased by five points. 
in the district since the last time they polled it. Also, Donald Trump's approval rating, they say, in this district has increased by five points in the same time. So you could see how those two things maybe go hand in hand. So again, for Democrats in those districts, those Clinton won Republican held districts, Democrats have the potential to get a long way towards 23 right there. Republicans just need to sort of contain the damage there. And then the question becomes this much larger battlefield. We're looking at about 70 districts here that we're keeping a particularly close eye on where Democrats think they've got a chance, some kind of chance uh, to pick off Republican seats. Now you start, it's not just Clinton won districts. Now you get into districts that Republicans hold, but that Donald Trump won. Maybe they're open seats, you know, without an incumbent, it's a little easier for the opposition party. Maybe just the nature of the district. Democrats think they got a shot this year. A whole variety of, of things here. But you just see, if Democrats get a big chunk of those Clinton won districts, and then you're opening up to a much wider battlefield like this, it just, there are so many different avenues to get to that net gain of 23 seats on the Democratic side. But again, I'll give you an example of if you're a Republican looking for some encouragement here, I'll show you a new poll out of one of these districts today. This is Illinois' 12th district. In Illinois' 12th district, this is southern Illinois, goes, you know, Carbondale, uh, East St. Louis, sort of rural farmland around there. This is a district Donald Trump won by 15 points in 2016. you got a Republican incumbent here. This is a brand new poll. Just finished up last night. Republican incumbent leading here by nine points. There was polling about a month ago that showed a much closer race here. So Republicans saying that their energy level is up, that maybe there's been some rallying around their party, maybe some rallying around Trump because of Kavanaugh. They'll point to a district like this and say, hey, it's a Trump district. Democrats are targeting it. Polling was quote close a month ago. Now you look at it and you see a nine-point advantage for the Republicans. So from a Republican standpoint, Point, you know, they just hope there's a lot of Trump districts here that Democrats are targeting, that Trump won by five points, by eight points, by 10 points, by 15 points in some cases. And what Republicans would just need to do, just need to keep winning them, just win as many of them as they can. Probably a lot of them end up being two, three, four point races. They need them, like almost all of them to just break their way. And, and so just to limit the Democratic gains here, limit the Democratic gains in those Clinton seats and, and somehow hope it all comes in just under 23 seats and Republicans can just hang on to the House. From a Republican standpoint, that's what they're hoping for. From a Democratic standpoint, you can see it's just, you know, if things break a couple points their way, boy, a lot of these could suddenly start falling. Could be talking about a pretty big victory there for Democrats on Election Day. So wide range of possibilities here. But again, with that idea of Republican energy going up, we have started to talk about that possibility that's out there that some way, somehow, the math does work out for Republicans and they do hang on to the House. So Wanted to give you a sense. We've been talking about that a lot on the air. We got a chance here to sort of break it down a little bit more in depth. That's a little bit of what we're seeing when we say that on the air. But I said we want to bring in some experts every day, sometimes from the right, sometimes from the left, sometimes from the middle. Today we are joined by a Republican pollster and strategist, Patrick Ruffini. He's partner and co-founder at Echelon Insights, and he joins us now. Uh, and, and Patrick, thank you for taking a few minutes. Um, I think we can put this up on the screen, actually. You said something, I think it was last night on Twitter, about this issue of Republican energy, the supposed Kavanaugh effect. You said the Kavanaugh high has officially worn off in upshot House polling, and we are now back to where we were in early September, maybe a point more Democratic. The, the upshot polling are these New York Times polls we're getting from all over the place. It just uh, curious to hear you say that. Maybe you could expand on your thoughts there a little bit. Uh, sure. Well, it does appear that the uh, Brett Kavanaugh nomination and how it played out was a shot in the arm for Republicans, reminding of uh, reminding Republican voters why you know they supported Donald Trump in the first place, why um, you know it's important to elect more Republicans in the Senate in particular, and so there was a very clear trend early in October. Um, for Republicans to be sort of outperforming sort of the benchmarks um, that they had I I relative to some of the earlier polling uh, this cycle in some of these races. We saw this in the widening it, 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 on the Senate side, but also in the House in the widening of the uh, margin in the Texas Senate race in Tennessee and in places like that. And again, all over the House map. Um, in the most recent round of polls, um, though, we've seen kind of a return back, or a reversion to the mean a little bit. Um, and there's a question of, of, of whether or not that enthusiasm uh, surge that we're seeing in somewhat in national polls 
where the enthusiasm metrics um, between Democrats and Republicans, Democrats had a very strong lead back in July and August that has that has narrowed, particularly around uh, this Kavanaugh issue. Um, you know, whether or not that is now sort of now baked in, or is that something that's faded away a little bit? Um, but at least in uh, the more recent uh, round of district polls, um, we've seen a little bit of a reversion back to where we were in early September. So I'm, I'm curious if you're able to put a, a number on that or just sort of a ballpark estimate, because I've seen, you know, 538, which does these estimates. I think I looked at it this morning. They said 86 percent chance they think that Democrats get the House. They get that net gain of, uh, of 23. I guess maybe let's use that 86 percent from 538. Mm -hmm. Does that sound about right to you? Does that sound too high, too low? Well, it's about re I think that sounds about right. I think what they are doing is obviously like earlier in the cycle, 538, it was about 30, 25, 30 percent uh, of uh, a chance of a Republican, uh, Republicans holding on in the House. And what you're going to see is that number shrinking as even if nothing changes as we go head into Election Day, you're going to see those those types of numbers shrink because, hey, we're getting closer to the election. These polls are actually going to be more predictive of what's going to happen. Right now, we have a factor of it's still too. Two weeks out, a lot could happen, polls could change. Um, so these forecasts are really kind of, are not necessarily, uh, are reflecting uh, sort of the fact that, you know, it, it, we're running, you know, gradually the clock is, is winding down on this campaign. Does it seem, you know, we had in our NBC poll the other day Donald Trump's approval rating up to 47 percent, the high water mark he's had right. in our polling. I've seen some others that, that put him in the mid-40s, which is, you know, Republicans have been saying all year if they can get him in the mid-40s, they think maybe that gives him a, a fighting chance at hanging on to the House. Does that, that Trump increase in his approval rating we've seen in the last few weeks, does that feel fragile to you, like something that we might see drop back down before Election Day? Uh, you know, you know, it's hard to. T it's oftentimes very hard to tell from individual polls. But should it, should that increase be sustained, that is good news for Republican candidates. We've seen a very, very close relationship between presidential job approval and uh, you know Republican candidate performance in individual districts. So uh, you know, should that increase? Should that be real? If that is real, then uh, it is. Good news for Republicans doesn't mean they're out of the woods, doesn't mean, uh, doesn't mean you know, they're going to keep the House necessarily. But that is a number we, we, we've seen kind of 45 percent, uh, even 43 percent, sort of bandied about as a benchmark um, for Republicans to at least have a shot at keeping the House. So that would be one condition under which, uh, you know, it would be very, very difficult for them to keep the House if he is at 40 percent or in the very low, you know, on very close to 40 percent. Um, but if he's in the mid 40s, sure. When you look at uh, where the House is going to be decided, and I, I guess to a certain extent the Senate, but you know, focus on the House now because it seems there might be a little bit more suspense right there. And, and the message that the Donald Trump seems to be settling on here for the final days of this campaign, heavy on cultural themes, heavy on this idea of the caravan. Uh, what effect do you think that's going to have on Republican prospects? Is that is that a net positive for them, or is that going to just, you look at those suburban districts, is that going to push them farther away? Uh, well, there was a, there were some numbers out the other day that the mentions of Donald Trump in opposition uh, party advertising, and in, in this case, Democratic advertising, uh, mentions of the incumbent president are at an all-time low since 2002. So Democrats really aren't talking about Donald Trump in their campaigns. Uh, while Republicans, um, you know, actually are, uh, you know, much more so than you may expect. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, I think that reflects the fact of a battleground that uh, leans right uh, in the Senate especially, but also in the House to some extent. And it also reflects the fact that, you know, Democratic voters are, you know, extremely energized to vote because of Donald Trump. And there may be a calculation there that they don't need particular, they don't need reminding. Uh, but Republicans haven't been as energized throughout most of the election cycle, arguably until now. And Donald Trump is the number one motivator, and his issues are still a, a, a very uh, big motivator, um, particularly if, if the issue of immigration is something that's going to, you know, uh, be raised in the next couple of weeks. Um, that is something where Republican voters are just much more intense, paying much closer attention to that issue than Democrats, and that 
they, you know, are certainly hoping that that is going to help stoke Republican enthusiasm heading uh, into the election two weeks from now. I'm curious what you what you expect in terms of a, a gender gap this November, and, and I guess what you think is survivable for Republicans, maybe maybe this year and, and, and sort of long term. I, I say in our in our uh, mm -hmm. NBC poll, the, the advantage for Democrats with women was 25 points. I think the advantage for Republicans with men, it's actually gone up in the last few weeks. I think it's now 14 mm -hmm. points. So almost a 40-point swing between those two, plus 25 for the Dems with women, plus 14 for the Republicans with men. D do you think it's going to look like that on Election Day? Uh, that would be something. That would be historic if it did. Uh, it, all these signs are the gender gap is increasing uh, in this election cycle. It's going to be a record uh, for a uh, midterm election cycle. Um, you know, it was about a net of 15 points, the NBC, uh, in, in 2014 and 2010. The NBC poll had it, had it at something like 40 points. Um, you know, some of the individual district polls, however, have been a little bit more conservative of, uh, on where we will end up in terms of the gender gap. Uh, they're showing about a 20 to 25 point split on the generic ballot. It's a little bit narrower than that when you go when you look at these individual uh, races and you look at specifically how can individual candidates are doing. But it's certainly going to be a factor, and there's certainly a question. You know, is this a faction, Is this primarily a function of women moving into the Democratic camp, or do we also have some men uh, moving into the Republican camp, sort of canceling out that gain? Certainly, in Democratic primaries, however, that as we've seen throughout the cycle, um, women are voting at higher rates. Uh, we have record numbers of uh, women as nominees, but it's unclear that how that dynamic from a primary may play out in a general election setting. Yeah, and I, I guess I'm just curious, trying to play this out long term, and I guess that's always dangerous when you start looking at these numbers and things that look like they might be trends to, to try to think of it this way, but I think there's a We've had a gender gap for a long time, and it seems there's a possibility here that certainly in terms of women and, and their preference for the Democratic Party, that's reaching a, a new height right now, and there's a question of how lasting that could be. It is the, is the thinking among Republicans, the idea of finding strategies to, to sort of rein that in, to try to you know eat into that advantage Democrats have with women, or is, is there some thinking taking hold on the Republican side that, hey, maybe the, maybe the answer is to drive up Republican support with men and try to balance it that way? Uh, you know, I think there's thinking on both sides of that question. There are efforts to try and recruit more female candidates. Certainly uh, the fact that you have 50 percent of, uh, you know, open seat nominees, something like that, are women on the Democratic side is a, is a breakthrough. Uh, and, you know, we will have in all likelihood a record number of women in the House. So I think there's a great deal of concern about particularly on um, you know, uh, Democrats leaving Republicans in the dust in terms of, you know, women in office, um, particularly as a result of these, of these, um, of these, of this election cycle. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, we thought in, in some way that, uh, you know, this issue, this would be a major issue in 2016. And it actually turns out that, you know, women voted uh, in 2016 about where they voted in 2012 um, for Barack Obama versus Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was not able, as the first female nominee of a major party, able to increase her share among women. Um, but men voted slightly more for Donald Trump. So I think that's the kind of trend I think Republicans are hoping for out of this gender gap, that they're able to at least increase some of their support among men to cancel out um, what seems to be a movement of uh, women, and particularly college-educated women. You know, we should not, uh, we should not, uh, you know, paint all uh, voters of the same gender with a single brush here. Um, you know, I think that they're hoping for something like 2016 to happen again. And just to sort of close this out on, on, on sort of a bottom line question, if the Democrats need uh, a net gain of 23 seats to get the House, I, I'm curious, they certainly, listening to you, it sounds like you think they could get there. Um, what level would they have to start getting to you for, for uh, getting to for you to be surprised? Would it, you know, 30 seat gain, 40 seat? How high could it go on the Democratic side before you step back and say, wow, that, that was a lot more than I was expecting? 
Uh, I mean, I think that if you just look at the polls, you look at the combination of the polls and the ratings, I think it's fairly reasonable at this point to expect that there's, uh, it, there's uh, that a seat gain in the low 30s into the mid 30s would probably be as expected. If we get over 40, and I think like we also have within that a number of very tight races that could make the gain anywhere from you know high, mid to high 20s, which would be just on the cusp of a majority to uh, you know to 40. Uh, you have a lot of seats that are within a point or two. Um, if they start going over that 40 number, then sure, I think you'd consider that uh, that they really strongly overperformed. All right. Patrick Ruffini, Republican pollster, Republican uh, data expert. Thanks for taking a few minutes. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. And thanks for watching at home again. We're going to do this every day between now and the election. We're at the board. We're looking at the numbers there. We're talking to numbers experts. We're trying to get you ready for the big night two weeks from tonight, election night. We'll see you all right back here, noon Eastern tomorrow.